David, and thank you, Dr. Saman, for joining us this evening. Hi, everybody. Um, I would, first of all, just like to really thank you for joining us. I know that you're sitting in Singapore. This is a very late hour for you, so we're really looking forward to this discussion together. So just as a way of introduction, Dr. Jean-Louis Saman is a senior research fellow at the Middle East Institute of the National University of Singapore, as well as an associate research fellow with the French Institute of International Relations. He is also an adjunct lecturer at Yale and U.S. College. His research focuses on Middle Eastern strategic affairs, in particular the israel hezbollah conflict and the evolution of the Gulf security system. Prior to that, Dr. Saman was a policy analyst at the Directorate for Strategic Affairs of the French Ministry of Defense, a research advisor at the NATO Defense College, and an associate professor in strategic studies detached by the U.S. Near East South Asia Center to the UAE National Defense College. His most recent book, The Indian Ocean as a New Political and Security Region, looks at the changing geostrategic environment in the Indian Ocean region. So we are very much looking forward to your discussion today. And although our topic is Lebanon, as David opens this evening, I think the most pressing issue on everybody's mind right now is the ongoing crisis in Ukraine. And it'd be very interesting for us to hear your inputs on that. What are the ramifications for Europe as well as for the Middle East? So please. Thank you very much, uh, Ilanit. And uh, thank you very much to uh, uh, Elnet for the invitation. It's a, it's a pleasure uh, to be uh, with all of you. I don't know if I should say good morning, good afternoon, or good evening as I'm uh, based in uh, Singapore and uh, it's, uh, uh, I'd say, a uh, late evening uh, at the moment. Uh, initially, when we started discussing the, uh, the, the topic, obviously it was going to be about uh, Lebanon, which will be uh, the focus of my talk. But uh, given the recent events, I thought uh, I could just uh, maybe um, say a few words on the, what the Ukrainian uh, crisis, the invasion of Ukraine, means uh, for uh, European countries and uh, also for the Middle East. Uh, I happen to, uh, uh, to work, as uh, Ilanit mentioned, uh, for NATO for five years. And uh, uh, throughout my experience with NATO, I happen to uh, travel to, uh, to Ukraine. So I, I have a distant, um, distant experience with the, the topic, but still uh, I thought I could say a few words on that and then uh, move back, move to uh, uh, the, the topic of Lebanon. I mean, very quickly on uh, the uh, the topic of Ukraine. Uh, I think everyone uh, noticed. I would say uh, the, the most obvious thing was the surprising united front of European countries, uh, which is a good thing. Uh, uh, and the, the question mark being how long uh, can it be sustained. Uh, what we've seen after the, uh, the, the 2013, uh, 2014, sorry, uh, annexation of Crimea, initially the EU uh, also imposed sanctions against Russia and progressively uh, we've seen how politics in each of the uh, EU countries um, uh, challenged the, uh, the relevance of these sanctions. So let's hope that this time, uh, because of the... Uh, the shock that the, the, the invasion created, uh, we'll see an enduring uh, front from the uh, European countries. Uh, what we've seen also is uh, things which were uh, probably not conceivable uh, in the past, uh, not just economic sanctions, but uh, hard security decisions. Uh, NATO activated for the first time its response force which is uh, a roughly a force of 40,000 people, 40,000 soldiers uh, that can be uh, deployed quickly uh, at the borders uh, uh, near uh, the Ukrainian uh, theater. We don't know yet exactly how, uh, what will be the breakdown of the, the response force of NATO. And uh, uh, it's obviously a, a signaling uh, deterrence. It's not uh, I would say preparing for war with Russia, but it's a it's a significant uh, gesture uh, from the alliance. In addition to that, I think what was even more inconceivable was the decision of uh, the European Union to announce the, uh, the the support the military support to Ukraine through the armament 
that is uh, the armament package that the EU announced uh, yesterday. Uh, beyond that, uh, so these are the the, the short term uh, short term uh, um, decisions, which I think uh, took a lot of people uh, by surprise, given the the scale of these decisions. Uh, beyond that. Uh, what I think is still difficult to uh, uh, measure is the economic consequences, uh, how, uh, especially in the energy sector, we still don't know how this will play out. Uh, and day by day, uh, we uh, will uh, probably have uh, more on that. Uh, the two things which I think on the long term, and when I say the long term, I mean uh, beyond the, the next six months, which are going to be very difficult to, um, uh, to conceive is what kind of relations do we conceive with Russia? Uh, because whatever the outcome of the war uh, in Ukraine, uh, we're going to have at the, a moment to uh, rethink uh, the relations uh, with Russia. I mean, it's not uh, going to be possible just to resume the day before the invasion of, of uh, Ukraine. Uh, and as we speak, I understand that uh, Ukraine is going to apply formally uh, to the European Union, uh, not assuming that it will become a member, obviously, but uh, this is part also of the, 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 the ongoing bargain that uh, the Ukrainian government uh, uh, wants to push uh, with the talks with Russia. In addition to the relations with, with Russia, I think something which is going to be a game changer is also the, uh, the, 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 the military expenditures uh, in Europe. We've seen the, the announcement of uh, Germany on that, and we'll probably see uh, new significant uh, defense expenditures across uh, NATO. This leads me to uh, the Middle East, because I think, uh, the, there are two big consequences on that, uh, and I, I, these are uh, obvious. That would be, from my point of view, uh, not not very positive consequences. First, I think it it will inevitably lead to um, uh, reconsider reconsideration or revision of the U.S. and European commitments to the Middle East. This was also this was already in the air uh, with regards to the U.S. Uh, administration uh, with its global posture review, which was uh, released uh, in November and which announced that the Middle East would be of lower priority vis-à-vis uh, -vis the Indo-Pacific and Europe. Clearly, now after what happened in Ukraine. Uh, I think there will be a huge struggle in terms of allocation of resources, military resources between the Middle East and Europe. Uh, and this explains to, my, to me, it explains the reason why we've seen in particular Gulf states, which rely heavily on the US, Gulf states didn't uh, uh, explicitly condemn the uh, invasion of Ukraine. Uh, you had the UAE, which was a, a member of the uh, UN Security Council uh, for this term until next year, that decided to abstain. I mean, it's the only country with China and India that decided uh, to do so, uh, despite several calls from uh, Secretary of State Blinken. So this is, we're going to see, I, th I think, more and more ambiguity uh, from uh, uh, traditional U.S. partners in the region that sees this crisis also as a, uh, a, 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 the trigger for U.S. disengagement uh, from the region. Now, let me move to the, uh, uh, the, the crisis in Lebanon, which is also uh, another ongoing crisis. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll just try to uh, uh, summarize here the causes and the consequences of this crisis and maybe we can uh, uh, we can discuss uh, some aspects um, more in particular uh, during the discussion. Uh, this crisis that we've seen that we've been experiencing with Lebanon uh, in particular since 2019 
obviously took its roots, uh, I would argue, with the end of the civil war in Lebanon in uh, 1989. I won't go back to the history of that. Uh, we only have one hour. Uh, but what we've seen over the last three years is first a social, social revolution. It called itself a revolution in October 2019. Uh, where you had Lebanese people going in the streets of Beirut uh, and uh, the, uh, calling for a new, a new political system uh, which would go beyond the sectarian uh, system that has been ruling uh, Lebanon for years. Uh, unfortunately, this social revolution uh, did not succeed. Uh, it, only led to the, um, the fall of the Saad Hariri government at that time, led to a new government that was unable uh, to fulfill any of the promises made uh, to, the, um, to the movement uh, of uh, October 2019. But in addition to that, the reason also why this movement and this short momentum for uh, a post-sectarian Lebanon uh, uh, faded away was the economic crisis that Lebanon has been experiencing uh, since uh, approximately the same moment. Uh, at the beginning of 2020, what we've seen is the complete collapse of the Lebanese currency. The Lebanese pound lost about 90% of its uh, value against the dollar. Uh, what it means is that more than half of the population is now uh, below the poverty line. Uh, international organizations such as the World Bank estimates that what we see today in Lebanon in terms of economic crisis is one of the three worst economic crises of the last two centuries. So uh, it has, and we will go back maybe to that, uh, it has also security implications because this crisis impacts first and foremost the civil servants and, for instance, uh, law enforcement officers and military officers that in, in many cases uh, lost their, uh, uh, their power, uh, their, their, their salaries or just uh, are unable to fulfill their, uh, their missions. Uh, on top of that, you have a failure which did not start with this crisis. This is a long uh, failure of the Lebanese political class to address uh, these issues. Uh, as I said, we've seen the, the fall of the Hariri government in 2019, followed by another government of Hassan Diab that was not able to do anything. And then uh, a new government now uh, with Najib Mikati. Uh, these governments have been unable uh, to, uh, uh, to deliver on the need for reforms, not just from the Lebanese population, but also from the international community, and in particular, the International Monetary Fund that has been demanding for specific reforms with regards to the transparency of the financial system uh, before uh, providing uh, uh, an aid package. This leads us to the next election because at the moment, nothing, nothing can change uh, as long as there's no uh, new election. The next election are scheduled for May, uh, so May of this year. That is if they are not postponed. Uh, at the moment, there are rumors uh, that you may have heard of uh, that some political parties will uh, find ways to uh, just postpone these elections. Uh, we have no confirmation of that, but what we know is that there's a lot of uncertainty regarding uh, the outcome of this election. And the reason why a lot of political players uh, would, be, uh, would be in favor of postponing them is that a lot of these actors are weak at the moment. First, you have Saad Hariri, which, is, which was for the last a decade or so, the leader of the Sunni uh, political uh, scene. He has been the leader of the future movement uh, in, uh, in Lebanon and was seen as the leader of the Sunni uh, community. 
He left, he decided to resign uh, from political uh, life uh, recently, last month, and there's no idea on who could be his replacement. There have been talks that his brother, Baha uh, Hariri, might play a role uh, as the leader, although uh, most of the observers have been questioning his uh, capital, his political capital, and his political legitimacy to uh, uh, replace his brother. Uh, this is for the Sunni uh, coalition, the, 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 um, the axis, the coalition of uh, Hariri. Uh, on the other side, you have the coalition of Hezbollah, which is currently uh, uh, having the majority in the parliament. The thing right now is that Hezbollah's coalition is not very strong either. Uh, the reason for that is primarily because of uh, corruption cases that have been undermining two of the main allies of Hezbollah. Uh, the ally uh, number one, Amal, the other Shia uh, party, and his leader, Nabi Beri, uh, who has been also compromised in uh, several corruption cases. Uh, there's also the other movement, which is part of this coalition, the Free Patriotic Movement, which is the, the movement of the president, Michel Aoun, and of uh, uh, the, the current leader of that movement, Gibran Basil, who's also uh, uh, tarnished by uh, corruption cases. So at the moment, you have a situation where uh, both coalitions are uncertain, uncertain about what they could gain from the, uh, the, uh, the election. So there are reasons on both sides to postpone the elections. Some uh, observers would argue that uh, because of the discontent with Hezbollah and uh, the corruption cases uh, that, uh, that compromised some of Hezbollah's allies, the other side, so the Sunni camp, might uh, win the elections. But others question the leadership of that coalition, the coalition of Hariri, because without Hariri, it's very difficult to imagine how this coalition could be uh, uh, running. So this also explains why uh, the international support to Lebanon has been uh, uh, decreasing. Um, and if you look at the international support, basically, apart from President Macron, uh, you could say that nobody really cares about Lebanon anymore. Uh, Gulf states uh, got tired of Lebanon uh, years ago and tired and even uh, annoyed to the point where you have now uh, uh, Saudi uh, Arabia uh, that uh, put pressure on the Lebanese government uh, last year because of talks, uh, because of statements made by one of the uh, 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 Lebanese ministers uh, that was negative about Saudi Arabia. Uh, the only Gulf country that seems right now to try to uh, restore the ties between Lebanon and Gulf states is Kuwait. Kuwait uh, uh, sent his its foreign minister last month to Beirut to try to mend the ties uh, between uh, Lebanon and the Gulf states. Eventually, Lebanon needs the Gulf states, uh, both for security reasons, to balance against uh, Iran's influence inside the country, but also for economic financial reasons. Because Gulf states, uh, even during the civil war back in the 80s, were uh, those that helped uh, Lebanon uh, to maintain some kind of economic stability. Uh, so this is, uh, unfortunately, the current state of international support. I don't even talk about uh, the U.S. because the U.S. didn't pretend it had put uh, Lebanon on, on its agenda in the Middle East. That's also something that is quite revealing. In the last decade, uh, the U.S. interest, the U.S. Uh, uh, U.S. investment on Lebanon completely uh, disappeared. This leads me to my last point, which is what does that mean for Israel? And uh, I think here uh, what's uh, worrying uh, is what we've seen uh, in the last year uh, in terms of 
steady escalation with Hezbollah. Uh, I would say steady, but it's not full uh, full scale escalation, obviously, at the moment. But what we've seen is Hezbollah um, uh, exchanging rockets uh, last uh, <clears throat> last August uh, with Israel. It was uh, in a strange tit for tat situation after the war in Gaza. Uh, and it was first Palestinian organizations in Lebanon firing at uh, Israel. And after Israel uh, retaliated, Hezbollah decided on its own uh, to launch rockets as well. Uh, we've seen also uh, 10 days ago uh, Hezbollah using drones to uh, uh, to uh, fly uh, um, uh, beyond uh, or to cross, sorry, to cross the Israeli airspace. And this is also signaling, indicating Hezbollah's confidence, Hezbollah testing uh, how far it can go uh, <clears throat> with uh, the, uh, the Israeli, uh, the Israeli uh, uh, response, the Israeli government. Uh, I would argue that there are two elements to consider uh, apart from the military, uh, the military balance, the, the military uh, arsenal uh, that Hezbollah has in, in the south, which is still uh, very significant. In addition to that, two other uh, factors that will uh, influence the possible tensions are number one, obviously, the elections. Uh, if we see Hezbollah becoming weaker uh, with the elections, uh, there might be a temptation uh, from Hassan Nasrallah uh, to uh, to use tensions again, to use tensions with Israel as a way uh, to, to strengthen its role domestically within Lebanon. In addition to that, obviously a big uh, factor will be. The outcome of the ongoing negotiations uh, with Iran, uh, not just on the nuclear file, but also more broadly, uh, what uh, is happening uh, in terms of Iran and Gulf relations, Iran Gulf negotiations on regional policy. Uh, it doesn't look good, honestly, when you uh, look uh, not just about the nuclear file, but also about. Iran's regional policy. We don't see at the moment any uh, sign that Iran is interested in de-escalating its support to proxies in the region. So again, that that is uh, uh, that is something that uh, will play a role and probably negatively uh, in the tensions uh, between Israel and Hezbollah. And I'll leave it here. Sorry if I was uh, too long. Not at all. That was very thorough and very interesting. Thank you very much for that. Um, covering so many different aspects and elements of this topic. And I think, you know, something that really stands out is a lot of people, I think, view the Lebanon crisis from a financial perspective, but it really has so many different aspects and, and elements to it, including the political side. Um, and as you mentioned yourself, you said that, you know, aside from France, it seems like there is not much international interest in the crisis. And, and I'm wondering if, you know, France might continue to play this role and if there might be a red line as far as France is concerned. Well, what, what we saw with the, uh, the uh, initiative of President Macron after the explosion of uh, the, the, Be the Beirut port, uh, was uh, the decision of Macron to uh, engage with the entire political community in, uh, in uh, Lebanon. And uh, he made the choice to uh, engage not just with the traditional allies, uh, which were uh, the Hariri uh, coalition, but he, uh, he spent time, significant time, uh, engaging also uh, directly with Hezbollah. Uh, and Unfortunately, his initiative uh, did not succeed uh, for reasons that could have been anticipated, unfortunately, uh, because they, these were uh, by design. This was the, the, the political system and the, uh, the, the way uh, the, the, each of the, uh, the, the coalitions was protecting its interests. Uh, 
eventually Macron said uh, very openly uh, when uh, he was asked uh, back in late 2020 uh, about the failure of the initiative that that's not his role to change the regime that uh, he engaged with all the actors uh, and on that we can uh, discuss the fact that he decided to consider that Hezbollah was a legitimate political player uh, but he said very uh, very openly I cannot uh, I cannot uh, target I cannot antagonize uh, Hezbollah or even Iran on that uh, having said that Officially, uh, uh, France, as far as I know, did not abandon uh, Lebanon, but it basically said uh, the ball is in, the, in their camp, uh, and that it's not it's not there. It's not the French uh, call anymore. It's the Lebanese political class that has to take now ownership of the crisis uh, and uh, deliver on the reforms. So. It's a recognition of the failure of the initiative, uh, but uh, it, is, uh, it is not saying that uh, the, 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 the French government is uh, dismissing uh, Lebanon uh, now. Okay, so maybe to um, continue on that note, as you said, France was in, maybe was not passing judgment on um, on the internal affairs within Lebanon and that saying it's leaving it up to the Lebanese people to make their own decisions. But from a perspective from, from um, the European side of things, we have seen um, that there are European countries that are that are coming out with a full ban against Hezbollah. And this is something that Alnet works on very seriously. And so the question is, could we ever see France toughening its stance and going in that direction as well? Uh, in theory, yes. Uh, at the moment, uh, at the moment, uh, I, I don't, uh, I don't see. I, I didn't see in the, the last years uh, any sign uh, in that direction. Uh, I might be proven wrong if uh, things evolve, and uh, especially if we have uh, a, a new war. Uh, I think that that would. Uh, that would definitely change the, the French uh, the French view on that. The, the approach uh, in the last years was uh, in a sense that you have to deal with Hezbollah um, and uh, the, that especially after uh, Macron uh, decided to engage with the, the Lebanese government, a government where, which is based on a Hezbollah coalition uh, being the majority in the parliament. So it's, it's just impossible at the same time. It, you have to make a decision. Uh, it's either uh, you uh, antagonize Hezbollah uh, by designating either the whole organization or the, what you would call the military wing, uh, a terrorist organization, uh, but, or you uh, decide, like the government did, uh, to prioritize the, uh, the, 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 let's say, the restoration of uh, governance in the country. Eventually, that did not work either. So you may wonder, uh, was it really uh, the, 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 the best option? Uh, is it, because you may say it didn't work exactly for that reason, because uh, you consider Hezbollah being part of the system. And that as long as you have something like, Hez like Hezbollah, the Lebanese state will always be dysfunctional. Um, but that's where you have, I I'd say, a, a major uh, difference of philosophy or diplomatic approach between France and the US, I would say. Yeah, and I think um, that's a very interesting point. And and I, and as you said, we see that the U.S. is pulling out more. You mentioned this yourself, and um, so you know, do, could we see a bigger role for France for other European countries? And also, what could this mean for for Israel and the ramifications ramifications here as well? 
So, sorry, the question is? So, uh, just to elaborate maybe a little bit further on, as you mentioned earlier, um, you know, on the fact that we do see the U.S. pulling out more and maybe now turning its attention to other areas in the world, do we think that there could be a greater role for European countries to play here? And also, what could it mean for Israel as well? Well, the thing is, the... Uh, in, on, on the specific topic of Lebanon, uh, then we can maybe uh, uh, elaborate also on uh, other areas in the Middle East. But on Lebanon specifically, uh, the Europeans were already uh, more active in a sense than uh, the Americans, meaning that they they were uh, active within the uh, UNIFIL uh, forces inside the country. Um, <clears throat> And uh, there was this idea that, uh, that, that, that the, the, the French, the Italian, and the Spaniards uh, would be more active diplomatically uh, to engage uh, with the, the Lebanese government. Uh, I should mention that obviously the, uh, the Americans also played a major role uh, when it came to the, uh, um, the sponsoring and the training of the Lebanese armed forces. So it's not completely, uh, they, they are not completely uh, leaving uh, the country. Uh, but in terms of poly political uh, interest, uh, clearly uh, it's more uh, a topic for the Europeans now. But the thing is, even if you, we consider that this may lead to uh, increased European investment, uh, the Europeans have limitations with what they can uh, provide. And on the French initiative uh, with President Macron, we saw that vividly. The fact was that uh, President Macron could not really coerce uh, the Lebanese political class. He didn't have uh, the ability to do so like the US would have. Uh, he, he didn't have the ability, for instance, to uh, put pressure on Iran uh, to uh, decrease its support to Hezbollah, or at least to force uh, Hezbollah to align uh, with uh, the initiative. So this, this would be, I would argue, the, the problem that France and other European states uh, would face, uh, because at the end of the day, you cannot solve the Lebanese crisis only uh, domestically or uh, from within. You have to, to solve it from without, meaning uh, through the uh, regional players that matter inside Lebanon. And we know them, uh, for the most part, uh, when, we, when we talk about spoilers, it's uh, Iran. So the Europeans don't really have uh, that ability to pressure Iran uh, inside uh, Lebanon. So that, that would be the problem, this limitation in terms of uh, the credibility of the Europeans as a, a strategic actor here. And speaking of Iran, of course, we know um, that they are, they are helping fund and arm Hezbollah in Lebanon and through Syria as well. And, and we know that Russia is, um, of course, present militarily in Syria. And can we anticipate that there would be a closening as well between Lebanon and Russia? And how would this impact, you know, this, this kind of channel between Iran and Hezbollah as well? Well, uh, you, you, you're wondering if uh, we can speculate about ramifications of the, the, the invasion of Ukraine and its impact on Hezbollah, Iran, or... Well, if it reaches to that point, possibly, but I was thinking more on a broader um, outlook of whether or not there could be a closening between Lebanon and Russia um, and how that would play into things. I don't know if as if, if you think as an outcome of the crisis, and that would be interesting to hear. But. It, well, it's, it's, a complex, it's a complex situation because you, you would see contradicting messages. Uh, the Lebanese government uh, condemned the uh, the invasion. Uh, they were they were actually uh, one of the few Arab countries that was explicit about it. Uh, Hezbollah did not uh, condemn the uh, the invasion, and uh, I believe they 
they use the, the, the rhetoric, the, uh, the classic uh, rhetoric, uh, which is that the war was caused by NATO aggression and that uh, Russia was basically uh, trying to secure its own uh, interests. Um, uh, Iran, as far as I know, uh, had the same uh, message, which was that NATO was responsible for the war. I, I cannot, I, the last time I checked, uh, Iran did not condemn uh, the, uh, the invasion. I, I, might, I might be uh, wrong on that, uh, if someone uh, uh, has uh, the detail on that. But, but more broadly, beyond the, the, the war uh, in Ukraine, the thing is that Russia and Iran it, 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 it was never historically an alliance. It's more like a, a marriage of convenience from time to time. Uh, and we saw that uh, in particular uh, in, uh, in Syria, uh, where uh, there was cooperation uh, and Hezbollah in particular uh, um, was able uh, to gain a uh, very precious uh, war fighting experience, uh, fighting uh, alongside the Iranians and learning also from the Russians. But at the same time, uh, uh, we know that uh, Russia coordinated or at least uh, did not oppose uh, Israeli uh, airstrikes on uh, Iranian positions in uh, Syria. So that tells you how how uh, how loose uh, this relation between Russia and Iran is. So uh, that's why I say you will see message uh, contradicting messages because uh, again the the Lebanese government condemned the uh, the, uh, the invasion and that the fact that you have uh, the government condemning it and at the same time the strongest military actor inside the country uh, having the opposite uh, position, this tells you everything about the, the, dysfunctional, the dysfunctional state of uh, Lebanon uh, and the fact that uh, the, probably the most consequential uh, statement here is Hezbollah. The, he the foreign policy of Hezbollah might be more consequential than the foreign policy of the Lebanese government, unfortunately, here. That's very interesting. Um, and yeah, I want, you know, I wonder if at some point they may try to turn to Russia to try to look for, for some kind of uh, assistance in getting out of this financial crisis. But then, you know, the question is, how would that play into all these uh, contradicting tensions, as you mentioned? Um, maybe we'll look a little bit more um, zoom out a little bit more on um, the region as well. Um, we've seen a lot of uh, cooperation around energy. This seems to be a topic that's been um, becoming more and more present. So, um, you know, there's the Eastern Mediterranean Gas Forum, which includes European countries as well as uh, Israel and, and Arab players. Um, there is the recent agreement on solar energy and desalination between Israel and the UAE. And there have been reports that have come out of surrounding Israel um, exports, excuse me, exporting gas um, to Lebanon via Syria. So it, could this be an indication of a new age of um, regional cooperation on the topic of energy possibly? Uh, it might, uh, I mean, um, beyond the, beyond the, uh, the um, uh, I, I think in a sense, this discussion on, uh, uh, on the, the, the potential cooperation between Israel and uh, Arab countries, in particular uh, Lebanon, uh, through uh, the energy domain and uh, the, the gas, and I think Egypt is also involved in uh, these discussions. Uh, though, as far as I remember, there were constraints because of uh, uh, because of uh, U.S. sanctions on uh, Syria. So I'm not sure how far uh, this this can go. Uh, but more broadly, I mean, definitely, we we see an evolution of the mindset. Um, in the region when it comes to uh, uh, relations with Israel. I, I don't want to repeat things that you may have discussed in other 
uh, webinars, uh, but as I lived in uh, the UAE over the last five years, I've, wit I've witnessed that change of mindset uh, very concretely. The fact that um, five years ago, uh, Israel, the, the, the very name of Israel was still a taboo in, uh, in uh, the UAE. And that suddenly, uh, for the last two years, uh, it, it, is, uh, it is becoming not just a normalization of, of uh, the ties, it's becoming a normal uh, partner, meaning that it's a daily, you, you see that in the, the, the daily newspapers that there is a cooperation and that it's not just about strategic security cooperation. As you mentioned, there's uh, uh, gas, uh, gas projects, there is uh, technology, tourism, and so on. So what I mean here is that there's clearly a change in the, the way uh, Israel and the, the, the Arab states can discuss uh, cooperation, in particular economic cooperation. And we didn't see since the, uh, since the Abraham Accords, uh, we didn't see any, uh, any uh, retaliation or any backfiring uh, phenomenon. Uh, which was something that people were anticipating when it was announced. People were saying there, this, this will lead to a huge uh, uh, reaction from the Arab street and so on. We didn't see that. So definitely there's a change in terms of the mindset. Yeah, and I think that's a very welcome change. Um, and so to follow on that, do you think that there is room for the European uh, countries to play a bigger role in um, establishing and expanding the Abraham Accords? Uh, how would you see that? Uh, I mean, because the, the Europeans were, uh, were not really uh, involved in any way. So uh, I, I, I'm not sure how they would, uh, they would engage, because that's, that was obviously uh, promoted by the U.S. administration. Uh, but at the moment, uh, what we see is mostly bilateral or trilateral uh, cooperation involving uh, either Israel, UAE, plus the U.S. or Israel, Bahrain, uh, plus the U.S. or Israel, uh, Bahrain, UAE, and uh, the U.S. But, I mean, obviously, the, uh, the Europeans uh, supported uh, the, uh, the agreement. Uh, I don't remember any declaration that was ambivalent on that. Uh, but beyond that, I, I, think, I think it's actually uh, it's more significant in terms of uh, relations between Middle Eastern countries than between Middle Eastern countries and Europe, because what we see uh, over the last few years is that, for instance, Israel and the UAE are getting closer, even without the Americans in the room. Uh, you see discussions, uh, especially uh, with regards to relations with India, with China, that are sometimes going, uh, going against what the Americans uh, would want. So what's interesting is that it's, a, it's also a, 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 a dynamic on its own, a, a phenomenon uh, that has been growing within the region itself. Okay, well, thank you very much for this. It's been very interesting. And